Hey, Bianca. I'm really glad that you are with us still and for all the people that are watching because um, it's kind of absurd that we should have any limits on the conversation around mm -hmm. abortion access mm -hmm. and reproductive justice and disability justice. Mm -hmm. um, so we're going to make four short videos we discussed. Great idea. Thank you, Bianca. So this one will be about the history of the reproductive justice movement in the U.S. Yeah. So the history of the reproductive <coughs> justice movement very much aligns with the disability justice movement in that it's been going on for centuries, but we didn't have the language to describe the movement until the 90s. So the reproductive justice term was um, coined by a group of women of African descent who met at an international conference in Cairo and talked about the need to be able to recognize that uh, young women and girls require certain types of support and access to quality medical care, which includes not only becoming a parent and choosing your birth outcome, but also being able to parent your child in a safe community and being able to decide to not be a parent. And that being linked to body autonomy and the right for people to make choices about what happens to their bodies. Um, they then met in Chicago, Illinois in 1994 and decided to create that term into a movement and also founded the organization Sister Song, which you can um, access at sistersong.net. They are a national reproductive justice organization. They are only they are also the only reproductive justice organization that hosts a reproductive justice conference. And that conference is called Let's Talk About Sex. And there will be a conference held this year, October. Um, in Atlanta. I should also disclose that I am on the board of directors for the uh, for Sister Song. <laughs> and so I definitely have a bias when it comes to that. But I also believe that the work of reproductive justice um, is rooted in access and access to quality care. Mm -hmm. And that very much is in line with disability justice. Um, mm -hmm. And our ideas of who gets to have a body that's respected and who gets to experience respect when they're looking for survival and being able to thrive in the life that they choose for themselves. Mm -hmm. So that's a little bit of history of the reproductive justice movement um, and how it became something that we're understanding today. The language is still very binary um, and it does have a very male, female, woman, man language and that's slowly evolving as with many different types of language. Language is alive. So we're seeing more of an inclusion of people who are non-binary, people who are trans identified, uh, intersex people, and a variety of other community members who are often not included when using that language. And I like to say that that's just some debris of the early movement. Um, so you're gonna see some language shifting and that's thanks to young people and people from the communities that have been excluded. Mm -hmm. So in many ways, uh, language is a way that we see a shift of the reproductive justice movement expanding. That's great, that's mm -hmm. great. And from what I remember, um, fr from actually when it was developing, part of it was in response to the kind of single issue focus of um, the reproductive rights movement around mm -hmm. um, abortion and not acknowledging that so many women and parents um, are are left out of parenting conversations mm -hmm. and you know while a white person might be encouraged to um, you know uh, it's, it's an automatically assumed thing that they would have children that other people were being pushed mm -hmm. to not have children mm -hmm. um, and were being pushed toward um, you know everything from sterilization to abortion to mm -hmm. birth control without uh, consent and um, that you know to the reproductive justice movement really addresses more robustly mm -hmm. um, parenting and, mm -hmm. and under what conditions are we making these choices. Right, right. And are those choices our own to make or are we being coerced by the medical industrial complex? Mm -hmm. And that's a really important conversation for crit people to have because it's part of our lives all the time in many mm -hmm. different ways, especially if you were born with a disability. For those people who weren't, it's a different language that you learn and that you understand the framework of oppression much differently. Um, and I think also with reproductive justice, Justice and the history of it, you know, Roe v. Wade was passed in 1973. And at that time, there was a huge movement uh, that you might know about called the women's movement, or the feminist movement. And so this language was also created around reproductive justice because they understood that the language of the women's movement was very exclusionary mm -hmm. and only focusing on racially white women or women who had the means to find a private doctor who could offer them an abortion in private mm -hmm. versus finding a clinic or something of the like. 
right? So there's definitely an economic justice feature to reproductive justice, Mm -hmm. as well as challenging um, white supremacy. So it incorporates a racial justice framework as well. That's great. Which leads us into our next question. So we'll come back with video number two to talk about that. Great.